when I think about all of the times we talk about the value proposition, especially for smaller schools, often with some values statement or mission statement, right, that's driving what they're doing. And then we have the government that's like, okay, well, we don't really know how to measure how you're impacting your students' lives. So can you just tell us, like, do they get employed and how much money do they make start, starting off, right? And it's such the wrong conversation because we could list 50 things that we think we do for our students. And yet somehow we have condensed down our success and our measurements to can they get a job and how much money do they make? Rachel Phillips Buck. Hey, waiting for everyone to join us. Hello, all. You have joined us for cap and gown. Um, we don't have Anthony today, but I do have Matt Boisvert with me. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Great Good to afternoon. be with you. Yeah. Hey, Debbie. Good to see you. We have a lot to talk about today, and this is going to be some um, hard mental work that we are going to do for the next hour. It's such a timely topic, Rachel. I mean, this is when you think about everything that's going on, um, talking about these, what these cr crucial factors are and coming on the heels of, um, our Vincent Tinto conversations. So that's right. So our topic today is six crucial college factors to ensure future life satisfaction, which obviously we have a lot to say about this because we're going to spend the next hour talking about it. I think it's pretty remarkable um, that this information exists and I'm going to press pretty hard for you guys to um, make a case for this and then also to do some implementation on your campus. So thank you all for joining us. As always, happy to see my friends out there. Remember, you can always get connected with us by using um, taplink.cc slash Ferris resources. Lots of good information there for you. If you missed our um, series that we just finished last week on Vinto, Vinto Tinto, no, <laughs> Vincent Tinto, um, those are all on that uh, link. And so you can go, if you missed the terrible pictures of me and Anthony, in our sad haircuts, you can go look at that. Lots of good information there. So let me give you the rundown of what we're gonna do. State of the Union, as always. Then I wanna talk about the Gallup Purdue Index Report, which is our subject today. Um, also workplace engagement, which is incredibly important to future satisfaction. Um, and then we will talk about the big six factors that are tied to um, uh, well-being in your life in general. And then I'll give you, as always, your action items. Matt, I do have to say, so I don't know that everybody knows. Normally you sit next to me and just pass me notes about what I should be saying and questions I should be asking, and then also do PowerPoint. So today you have to be on camera. Um do PowerPoint I'm ready and just what you would normally write to me. You just have to say yourself. Yep. I'm ready. So you got a lot of stuff going on. If you guys have questions, feel free to send them the question and answer. If you've joined us by zoom um, or email me, if you just have general questions, and then I think we're doing some polls today. So I'm looking forward to that to kind of hear where you guys are. And we do have uh, polls. Have, All right. Yeah. Have so, you reflect on your experiences. So Rachel, what is the State of the Union? Okay, so I have a couple of articles that I wanna talk about today. Um, I actually wanna start with some information that comes out of this book. This is what I'm reading right now. Love the Price book. You Pay for College. It's by Ron Lieber. I've been reading it for a while. I got kind of bogged down because he has a whole chapter on like discounting and <laughs> like- The, fi the financial. Fine yeah. it's. I'm, I'm pretty smart and it was super hard to read, but I made it past it. So now I'm back in it. This is an entirely new roadmap for the biggest financial decision your family will ever make. Um, and I'm really enjoying this book. I would just skip that chapter because it's not great. But he is talking about counseling centers. So this is in the chapter called Undergraduate Mental Health Centers. Um, he cites a survey from the Center for Collegiate Mental Health at Penn State University, where a good friend Patty is now. Hi, Patty. Glad you're there. Um, 
So he says this, in six years, ending in 2015, utilization increased between 30 and 40% overall at counseling centers um, at institutions, while enrollment at those institutions was only up 5%. Okay, so, whoa. A also, large amount of- what? I mean, we have schools that have said it's way more than 40%. For sure. Well, remember, this is before COVID. So yeah. it was bad then. I think it's exponentially more difficult now, okay? Um, a large amount of that growth came from undergraduates who arrived with threat to self indicators, and those patients tend to use 20 to 30% more services than others who seek help. So you guys know, like you're working on a campus where it's just a lot of um, students are needing mental health services, but I thought this was interesting also. First of all, a school is lucky if they can afford one full-time therapist for every 800 students. Most schools, the ratio is nearly twice as high. So for those of you joining us in Zoom, I would be really curious to hear if you can just chat us your enrollment and the number of full-time counselors you have, that would be enlightening. Yeah. Um, also, because they're understaffed, so many schools are prioritizing rapid access to counseling instead of treatment. So what that means, is that counselors are trying to shed current clients um, because they need to, to accommodate the new ones that are coming. So it's not like long-term therapy. It's like, hey, we need to do this kind of short um, specific therapy for you. So the deprioritization of treatment in favor of access may have significant negative consequences for students in need, including a reduction in depression and anxiety symptoms. Okay. So that's that's the state of the union, but that's like a general state of union. Like right. we all know that that's going on, right? right? So there's an article in University Business today about how one mental health uh, center um, is now reaching 30% more students, which I think is fascinating. That's great. So um, given COVID, 94% of colleges and universities uh, in this survey said that they were concerned about students' uh, well-being, so a, a really large percentage, and a lot of them were worried about staffing. So overburdened, overwhelmed, and still coping with the impacts of COVID, college wellness centers are being counted on to be the backbone of support and service for students, but they can't do it alone. Increasingly, institutions are turning to telehealth um, and forging alliances, which will help them increase their network of providers. So this is like when we talk about Kintsugi and everything gets broken, you got to figure out what you're going to do, right, right, to do it better. Right. So Hamilton College in upstate New York, um, in 2015, they had three full-time staff people for 2,000 students. So which better than the ratio. For sure. Um, now, they have a new Johnson Center for Health and Wellness, and because of their partnerships with telehealth medicine, they have 16 part-time, multidisciplinary, and full-time people. So wow. that's amazing. Um, they felt like this was important because since 2015, the population, their student population that's using the center has risen from 12% risen from to 41%. So, and exactly as this book is saying, like more acute issues, we're talking about self, uh, suicidal ideation, self-injurious behavior. It's just more complicated problems to try to figure out what to do for students, right? So with this new staffing, it's like instead of 800 students per counselor, they've driven it down to 120 students per counselor. Yeah. It's amazing. It's great. Um, and they really have focused on three different pieces of counseling. The first one is direct clinical services so that all students can get good treatment. The second is this kind of big piece of wellness. So addressing things like anxiety and stress and, you know, meditation and all of those mindfulness things. And then the third one is because they're doing this online, they have this good crisis service. So they're like, if a student at 2 a.m. in the morning is having a problem, we have a way to get them connected to um, staff. I love that. Rachel, you were talking years ago about triaging um, and counseling services and the need you know, so even for students in some cases to be able to uh, talk to each other and how you can bring them together to deal with things like stress, which is at a different level yeah. uh, than some of the other issues that are faced in counseling. So, yeah. And I, 
I mean, I think there's a whole cap and gown on counseling and higher education. I just think um, it's a thing that continues to grow, as we've just said. And there are some really difficult problems with parents feeling like they can just bring their student to a university and they're going to get the kind of care that the parent would want them to get. And yet our institutions are oftentimes not well equipped to deliver that. I don't know, really, if, if you think about that ratio that they have now, I don't know if that's, you know, sustainable across yeah. the United States. For it sure. might be the number one job field to go into, if so. Yeah. Um, okay, this is, now listen, I don't want to get, I'm not trying to stir up any, don't send me emails about this article, <laughs> okay, because I'm just reporting the news. Okay. So there's an article in Inside Higher Ed about whether or not unions are now coming to admissions because um, by a majority 25 to 20, the student workers in Hamilton College admis admissions office voted to unionize. Okay, so these are tour guides and it, admissions fellows who interviewed prospective students. Um, what they think is going to happen is, be, so this is like the first entry of unions into admissions, kind of into higher education. I know you have some schools that have some unions for different areas, but it's pretty novel that this um, union has come in. They're saying that they think soon the National Labor Relations Board, which is the one who is kind of pressing this forward is going to file petitions for the representation of graduate assistants and undergraduate student workers. So that's very interesting. You just see how that would continue to press forward. The complaints at the school were that workers reported um, wage theft, being declined pay raises, an unrespectful work environment, being forced to give tours during heat advisories and other inclement weather conditions. Um, admissions also announced the return of in-person tours during spring 2021 without consulting guides. So those are all their grievances that made them decide that they want to join a union. Okay, yeah. so we can talk about that a lot. But listen, here's what I thought was most interesting. Okay. I mean, that's interesting, but this oh. is what I think is most interesting. Did you know that in 1980, there was a Supreme Court decision, the National Labor Relations Board versus Yeshiva University, Okay. That held that faculty members, since they are in effect part of the college management, they are ineligible for collective bargaining. So basically tenure track faculty, they were like, you have so much power and you're considered like in the ranking of how we decide what to do at a university, you are not allowed to use collective bargaining because then you would run amok. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I, didn't, I did not know that. I wonder if faculty know that. Um, yeah. So now the question is like that obviously was about tenure track faculty back in the 80s when tenure was a different thing than it is now. Um, but now the union leaders are saying we pro we don't think it should apply to all faculty. We have instructors, we have adjunct faculty, we have a lot of different positions that actually don't have as much power as a tenure track faculty member. And so they want to revisit that. So I... I think this whole topic of unions, this is interesting to me because you see some of the, um, especially with student athletes, how they're starting to organize um, yeah. and how that's starting to, to pay off for them. Um, but, you know, we we have friends who work in other industries who, uh, we, you and I had lunch with, with a person who was talking about the union, unionization of their employees. Yeah. And ultimately what it comes down to is treat your employees so well that, that they, would not they want wouldn't to want to do that. And so yeah. I, I think that's a really important part. I know that for student workers, sometimes they don't um, feel like they have a lot of say, you know, uh, on a campus. Yeah. But one thing that's really interesting that as I was reading about Hamilton is, is they were saying they have a, a they had a built a web page to talk to their student workers about what this decision would mean. And what they were saying is, hey, we have a good relationship with you. If we, if you go to the union side, then we no longer will have that have kind a of relationship. Man. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll have a middleman. So, which also, I mean, you know, we're always talking about the student athlete, student worker, like student comes first. And yeah. so I think if you just have that perspective, like these are students, you need to treat them really well. Like you would treat students, 
right? Don't right. Don't forget that piece. So right. Well, I hope okay. that works out. Yeah. Um, NCAA task force is recommending ending SAT and ACT requirements. Um, so standardized tests should no longer be required of high school applicants intending to play division one or two sports. That's what they announced on Friday. Mm -hmm. They created a task force um, in part to address the racial justice and equity issues and made this recommendation after six months of research and consultation with various organizations. Um, the National Association of Basketball Coaches tweeted its support of the move, noting it made a similar recommendation for NCAA basketball players last year. So they're going to talk about it. It's just a recommendation. They haven't decided. But Matt, you know, like we have so many schools that we're talking to, which are like, okay, well, help us understand then what is the substitute? We're just looking at high school GPA. Do we right. need to start weighing that differently? And a lot of concern at schools about it's fine if that's not the thing. If you guys decide that that is a bad measure, that's fine, but we have to have something right. so that we can make a determination of a good fit student for our support services and for our academic rigor, right? Yeah, so there's definitely that that piece of is, is you know, ACT or SAT, is that going to be helpful in kind of predicting a student's ability to, to perform and stay eligible? which is where that comes from. But when you think about the number of students who did not take the ACT, SAT, and, um, and, and so you have a, an issue there and definitely the inequity of, you know, for different test takers that we've yeah. seen. Um, but to your point, you know, I love what happens in Canada because they don't have standardized tests, but what they do is, is have standardized courses and across all high schools. And what they say is, I think it's three, maybe it's four courses, submit your scores on these courses and two or three courses that you would say best represents your interests and ability. Yeah. So, so you have some equity there because you're like, these are standardized. Right. And then you can give us what you like to do or felt like you did the best in, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Something has to happen. Yeah, we need a solution to that. So this last one, I'm going to take a deep breath before I dive into it because I, <clears throat> people in the office have heard me ranting about this article all week. When you first read it, it was the most exciting day in the office. I, yeah. It, it's been a while since I heard you so fired up. Okay. So I'm going to try to act like I'm non-biased. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So Columbia College Chicago says... Children can't be in the classroom and otherwise need advanced permission to be on campus for no more than an hour. Faculty, staff, and student leaders are united in their opposition to this policy. Okay, let me just get through it before we start, okay? <laughs> Last month, the college provost office published a new policy saying that employees and students um, cannot, can, cannot bring minors to class under any circumstances. Students and employees can bring their children elsewhere on campus, but only with prior approval and for no more than 60 minutes. The new approval process for hour long child visits works like this. Faculty members must ask their department chair for permission. Chairs must forward those requests to the senior associate provost. Other employees must ask their immediate supervisor who must ask the supervising vice president Students must seek approval from the Dean of Students. In all camp, uh, cases, minors can only visit campus with their parents or legal guardians. Okay, so they are saying because COVID remains a threat and they're trying to manage the risk, your kids can no longer come to campus. I cannot overstate how tone deaf I think this policy is. Yes. See how, see how circumspect like, I was that? that was I didn't yell. Would, would you like to try? So, so one, we always talk about, you know, rules are made because someone, like something was happening crazy on a campus. Like, I want to know today, what, in today's time, and especially everything that we've just learned about, like you and I were laughing about the guy on CNN who was like stiff arming his kid. And then uh, the kids were wrangled out of the room and he was so, but through COVID, like, Hey, we're real. We have right. families and we're balancing these and things. And also, childcare is hard to find 
People yeah. are stressed about jobs and trying to take care of their kids. Um, I will tell you, I mean, you heard the story of the, the, the sweet professor who the woman had a baby and she didn't have childcare. So she brought the kid to the classroom, but she couldn't stand up and bounce the baby. So he took the baby from her and bounced the baby while he was giving his lecture, which is it's right. Hard. It's right. If you are part of a campus, you know, part of that is your family coming and your kids riding their bike and knowing your call. I mean, I just don't understand. I, I think it's a good question, Matt. What happened where they were like, forget right it, out. kids are not allowed to come anymore, right? We're, well, you and I both talk a lot about community. Well, this, this kind of community is telling me something else. You know, like yeah. I want to go to a, be a part of a community where in a situation where you have to bring your child to campus. I want to welcome your child and not put and a realize timer, that is not put a timer on stop. Yeah, on. That is likely because of a hardship. It's not yeah. like people are like, oh, it'll be fun to bring my baby to class today. Whatever. Okay, let's move on. I'm, right. I don't want to talk All about right, that. Well. I mean, so mad. <laughs> um, and that is the state of the union. Hey. I remembered I had to make a note to myself. That was great to remember to do my sum up uh, slide. Okay. okay, so you guys, we want to talk today about these six critical factors. Hold on, Matt. Can you hide that for a second? Because I need to make the case for what we are about to try to accomplish, okay? Right. So there are six things, which I know it's not a silver bullet, like let's be careful of silver bullets. However, there are six things that if a student, a student experiences on campus, their well-being for the rest of their life increases and their work engagement increases. And so I'm going to talk about each of those elements and why they're so important. And then we'll get to the six things. But I want to say that your, your job and my job today is to lay out the data in such a way that when we finish, everybody who is listening to us is like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that this data existed. We have to implement these things for our students right away. We've got to measure what we're doing. And if we're not doing the things, we need to start implementing them right away. That's Absolutely. all we have to do to, over the next 20, 40 minutes. Okay? Well, when you brought this up, I mean, the way that it you you started off and then it went led to this and it led to this other, and ultimately, you know, for us, it, it comes down to then, yeah, the, if we're not, if we're not focused on these six factors, if, if we're not really focused on the, the outcome of college, what are we doing? Yeah. So I, I'm excited to, to help you lay this out. Okay. So I want to start with something that you talk about all the time, which is the promise that you make to students. Yeah. We promise students they will have better jobs, they will have better lives, they will be better educated. We're talking about their well being. And if you come to this university, this is the expectation. This is why you're making this investment because you're going to be successful and it's going to change the course of your life, right? Right. Um, so Mitch Daniels, who you may recognize as the former governor of Indiana, he became the president of Purdue. Um, in 2013, my sister and brother-in-law graduated from Purdue. I always call it per don't just to make them very unhappy. But after I've heard about what Mitch Daniels has done, I'm going to never make that joke again. Well, it's quite possible that, that, uh, former governor, um, Daniels, what he was concerned about is, is Purdue actually per don't. Yeah. He wanted to understand that. So he came in and he was like, I find the transparency and the accountability in higher education, the lack of those things, I find it shocking. And so I'm going to freeze tuition until I figure out what our value proposition actually is. I'm not going to raise tuition again until I can make a case for you that what you are getting at this institution is going to do what I promised it, what we promised higher education is going to do, which is, is make a better life. So I want to get some of, you and I are gonna be talking about his direct quotes and then also quotes from this survey that he did to try to prove the worth of higher education. So will you start with um, a couple of lines here about yeah. 
what college promises. So <laughs> this comes from his message, December 17th in 2013. He's sorry, says, Matt, this one doesn't. This actually comes from um, the the actual foreword to his report that he wrote. Okay. So, sorry. All right. When thinking about the ultimate outcome of a college degree, there is almost universal agreement about the value people seek and expect to increase the probability of getting a good job and having a better life. Yet there's not a single college or university in the US that is rigorously researched and measured whether their graduates have great jobs and great lives. Okay, which I love that because he's like, you're promising this thing. I just became the president. I'm looking around for data and studies that we can point to to say that's true. And shockingly, there's not. Yeah. Okay. For years, the value of a college degree has been determined not by the most important outcomes of a college education, but by the easiest outcomes to measure, namely job and graduate school placement rates and alumni salaries, usually only from their first job out of college. While these metrics have some merit, they do not provide a holistic view of college graduates' lives. These outcomes do not reflect the missions of higher education institutions, and they do not reflect the myriad reasons why students go to college. Amen. So I want to pause there for a minute because when I think about all of the times we talk about the value proposition, especially for smaller schools, often with some values statement or mission statement, right, that's driving what they're doing. And then we have the government that's like, okay, well, we don't really know how to measure how you're impacting your students' lives. So can you just tell us, like, do they get employed and how much money do they make start, starting off, right? And it's such the wrong conversation because we could list 50 things that we think we do for our students and yet somehow we have condensed down our success and our measurements to can they get a job and how much money do they make, right? right? Crazy. Okay, so this is from the message from President Daniels when he's launching. So he's like, there's no data. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find data. I'm going to take a, t a minute and I'm going to do my own study. So he um, connected with Gallup for the Gallup-Purdue Index. And he said, we have a responsibility to our students and families to ensure we are providing a collegiate experience that prepares them to be contributing and productive citizens in their workplaces and communities. This is a necessity because the world, potential students, employers, taxpayers, others, is demanding evidentiary proof that today's expensive college costs are worth the price. There is currently no adequate tool to help either employers or college bound students judge the relative value of any institution. We know how quickly and how many students graduate. We know their GPA. We know whether or not they have a job and are pursuing additional education six months after graduation. But beyond that, almost nothing. We need to know what happens next. Are our graduates leading fulfilling lives? Are they high performers and satisfied workers? Are they likely to achieve further successes? Are they engaged in their communities? Are there leaders? Amen. I love that he came in and was like, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. Right. Sure. So um, he basically like I said, partnered with Gallup and they created this index. And I think you have kind of what it says the index does there. So together Gallup and Purdue created an index that examines the long-term success of graduates as they pursue a good job and a better life. This index provides insight into the relationship between the college experience and whether college graduates have great jobs and great lives. Okay, so it's not a ranking system, which he is really careful to say. He's like, hey, I'm not talking about my rankings. I'm not saying like, we just want to be in the world. What is the magazine? US College, News. US News, right? This is a way that we can look at outcomes, not just GPA, but real success in life and know with certainty that we are doing what is right for our students and our future. So the emphasis on graduating successful joyful um, people who are embracing the meaning of life. He hired Gallup 
uh, February, for, uh, February 4th of 2014. So for a month, they called people every day and gave them the survey, almost 30,000 respondents. Yeah. These are students who have at least a bachelor's degree, are at least 18, have internet in their home or not in their home, have access to internet and all 50 states and DC. And so just ask these questions to try to figure out how it's going with you and what was the effect on your life um, after you graduated. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna start with is well being, because this is kind of the foundation to this report. They identified five different um, well being scales. So you can show those to us. Yeah. And they said, our graduates are either thriving, struggling, or suffering in these five different scales. So the first one is purpose and well-being. And this one is really tied to career satisfaction and job engagement, which we'll talk more about. This is answering questions like, I like what I do every day. Um, I learn something new or interesting every day. That's purpose well-being. So that's the first scale. The second one is social well-being. That is things like someone in my life is encouraging me to be healthy. My friends and family give me positive energy. How are you socially in your supportive relationships? How is your well being there? Then we have financial well being, which is effectively managing your economic life. Things like I had enough money to do everything I want to do, or in the past seven days, I've worried about money. So, financial well being, community well being. Um, this is the engagement you have with the place that you live, liking where you live, feeling safe, having pride in your community. Um, in the past 12 months, I've received recognition for helping to improve the city area where I live, those kinds of questions. So that's community well-being. And then physical well-being, having good enough health to get the things done that you need to get done. Things like I felt in the last seven days, I felt active and productive every day. My physical health is near perfect. Okay. So those are the five well-being views that he looked at. Which again, if we think about the lasting effects of college on our students, don't we want them to be successful in each of those places? Every single one of those areas? Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you think about, again, thriving, I'm doing great, struggling, it's a struggle, or suffering in each of those elements, one of the things that this poll did was look at where people fall, college graduates fall in each of these, how they would rate themselves based on some of the questions that they're asking. And also they determined that these are additive. So if you are thriving in two elements, you have some cumulative advantage over someone who is just thriving in one. So the goal is all five you're thriving in, this is how we are gonna measure successful living, right? So coming, coming out as a foundational piece to this, Trying, trying to understand um, the great jobs and great lives, so these five things. Rachel, I'm just thinking about at our universities, how are we being intentional in each one of these areas to be able to, to prepare students? One, to know, to know that this is a factor for their well-being and also to assess, hey, you're thriving or you're struggling or suffering. Yeah. And, and I think that that's, that's a really important first piece to this understanding of, of leading your students in the right direction. Well, you know, you and I were saying as we were looking at this, just knowing that this is a framework that we should be assessing for ourselves. Like when I go through those and I'm like, okay, I'm doing good there. I'm doing, oh, no, struggling a little bit there, struggling a little bit there. Even teaching students that framework to do, you know, it's like um, Anthony talks about doing a stand up with himself every morning where he's like, how's it going? How am sure. I doing right now? Right. Sure. Um, just the framework to say, these are the elements that you need to be assessing. And in college, we want to address those, but also as an adult, these are the places where you are gonna live an engaged life, right? Yeah. So a couple, of, uh, a couple of things that I wanna say, first of all, 29% of people in this survey are not thriving in any of these five elements. And, and, and that was before COVID. Yeah, this I mean, is I don't not- even know where it would be today. That's right. This is kind of old news, although we haven't talked about it before, right? Um, it's still relevant, but it definitely is not taking into account what's been happening in the last two years. So 29% are not thriving in any of these five elements. Hey guys, action item, write them down and assign thriving, struggling, suffering. 
which, you know, Matt, side note, we have talked about this before, like, um, what is it? The SSS was like succeeding, struggling, surviving, surviving, struggling. But I think suffering is a much better word because you know, if those things are not right, it is, you are suffering. It is very difficult. Well, I was, I was making the connection with success debt. If you think about your students, but also your graduates, if you're, if you would rate yourself as suffering, the amount of success debt that, that you're compiling there. And, yeah. and as you said, like additive, it's, it's additive on both sides. Right. You know? That's right. Um, okay. So 54%, I think I have a slide for this, but I'm going to read it for our podcasters. 54% of people who responded said they were um, thriving in purpose well-being, which remember that's about career and work. 42% said they were thriving in financial well being. 49% said they were thriving in social well being. 47% in community well being. And then 35% in physical well being. So I think that that's helpful just in the distributions of remember, college graduates, here's where they are. Yeah. Um, and I have not seen data that talks about non college graduates. So I wonder if they have a comparison group. I have not seen data on that, but maybe I've just missed it. But this is kind of a benchmarking for our college graduates. Here's what we'd expect. And of course, Purdue went back and said, okay, now we want to look specifically at our students, and they were doing much better than the average, which made their president very happy. But this is across all institutions. I just think so, it would be for each one of our schools to, to do that assessment to find out how are we doing? Are, yeah. are our graduates thriving in these areas? Okay. Only 11% of college graduates are thriving, strong, consistent, progressing in all five elements of well-being. So I have a slide for this too. 17% um, of college graduates are thriving in none of the elements. 19 are thriving in one, uh, sorry, 19% are thriving in one, 19% are thriving in two, 19% are thriving in three, 15% thriving in four, and then 11% thriving in five. So I find that really interesting. Um, if you just think about overall, one out of six of your graduates are not thriving in any of those areas. Yeah. So then what, um, the Gallup poll did was say, okay, we're going to take a step back and we want to look specifically at the well-being purpose, well-being, which is about career. And they focused on that because first of all, a lot of times that's tied to your college degree. So it's a direct association. Like the job that you're getting is tied to the fact that you went to college for a particular thing. But then also he just says like, you spend so much of your time in your career, in your job, that if we think about the bulk of the day, this being in your workplace, it's a thing that we really need to dig in. So we want our students to be thriving in all of those five well-being things. Now we're going to drill into purpose well-being, which is about workplace. So 39% of college graduates are engaged in work. And this is what this means. Engaged at work means that you are intellectually and emotionally connected with your organization and work teams. You're able to do what you are best at. You like what you do for work. And you have somebody who cares about your development at work. So that's what we're talking about when we're saying engagement. And you can imagine that's an awesome place to work. Right. You want to be engaged. That's where you get this energy from doing the things that you love and you're good at with a team that you love. Good work, right? It makes a huge difference as opposed to feeling like, I don't know why I'm doing this. It's stupid. It doesn't make sense. It's not making an impact on the world. It's not my best stuff. Nobody's rooting for me. So this idea of work engagement, um, purpose well-being is really important. Um, if employed graduates feel like their college prepared them well for life outside of it, the odds that they're engaged at work rise nearly three times. Wow. So if I feel like college equipped me to go out and live in the world in those different areas of well-being, I'm three times more likely to be engaged in work. And just as a comparison, Matt, can you put up, so we have engaged, we have 
I think disengaged, oh, engaged, not engaged and disengaged. So your choices when you're thinking about your work, which again, listeners, you can be doing a little assessment in your brain. You're engaged, you're involved, enthusiastic, loyal, and productive. You're not engaged. You are still productive and you're still satisfied. It's not that you're complaining or you're like, this is horrible. I hate it, but you are not intellectually and emotionally connected to your work. This is a place where I think um, you remember we talked last week about moving from burnout to demoralization, right? right? Where people went into higher education because they believe in it. They believe in the mission. They love the students. They want to invest in students. They're still productive. They're still like, I'm doing an okay job, but their work has changed in some ways. So they are not emotionally connected to it anymore. And that makes it so that you are a not engaged employee. So what, what percentage of employees are, would say that they're engaged? Um, 39% of college graduates are engaged at work, 39%. And then our last one is disengaged. And this is really where it kind of turns harmful, not only for the employer, but also for the employee and the team, because they are physically present. If you're disengaged, you're physically present, but intellectually and emotionally disconnected. Um, you're unhappy with your work and you're telling everybody about it. So you're sharing that, which is obviously more likely to jeopardize performance of teams and to kind of create a morale that is lower because you're talking about how bad it is. Okay. So we want our students as graduates to live engaged lives in their work. It's what makes good work, good work, feeling that I am connected to this mission and I believe in what we are doing. If college graduates are engaged at work, the odds are nearly five times higher that they will be thriving in all five elements of well being. Wow. Wow. So if you are engaged at work, we've just increased the opportunity, the chances that you are going to be thriving in all of those elements that we talked about before, right? Um, And then the odds of thriving in all areas of well-being more than double for college graduates when they feel that their college prepared them well for life outside of it. So I just want to make sure we're tracking. We have all of those five elements of well-being. We have being engaged in work. And then we have this thing, which is like, did my college prepare me to go out into the world to do engaged work and to be thriving in those five elements, right? So... I want to move on to our six elements because they're the meat, but I want to also tell you that this survey found with workplace engagement, here's what doesn't matter about your college. This does not matter when it comes to who is more or less engaged in their workplace. There is no distinction between graduates of public versus private colleges on employment engagement, but there's a substantial difference between graduates of for-profit institutions and the rest, okay? So that's one distinction. This one is very important as we are thinking about equity gaps and what we can do to help our students be successful. There are no differences in employee engagement by race or ethnicity or by whether the graduate has been the first in the family to attend college. So what that means is if you do these six things, if you equip your student to face the world after college, the likelihood that they're gonna be engaged workers and successful in these five other elements cuts out race and ethnicity and first generation risk factors. That's gigantic. And then lastly, as many graduates from the top 100 US News and World Report schools are engaged as uh, in their work as graduates from other institutions. So we're not talking about elite. We're not talking about rankings. We're not saying like, obviously the best schools do this and the worst schools do. No, we're saying this is a thing you have control over. And if you are implementing these six things, your students are going to be more successful in their life and their work. Okay. Well, Rachel, I think you've done a great job of setting this up of why it's important. Okay. I hope I've made my case because now I'm going to tell you what these six things are. These six elements of college experience are so strongly related to graduates' lives and careers, it's almost hard to fathom. When it comes to finding the secret to success, it's not where you go, but how you do it that makes all of the difference in education. That's pulled directly from this Gallup report. So what they're saying is, 
every single school can be in charge of deploying these six things. And it doesn't matter what the school is. It doesn't matter what your population is. If you do these things and you help your students go follow through, get these things, you are going to increase their um, success and satisfaction. Okay. That's great. So. I know you are, you guys are, that was a long buildup. I know you're dying to know what they are. All right. So we've separated them out into two different things. And I'm going to ask those of you who joined us um, to be thinking about your college uh, experiences, because we're going to pull these apart a little bit and we're going to do some polls on whether or not you experienced these things. The first um, of the sections of these um, six things has three things in it, and it's about support, which you guys will know that I'm going to change support to connection because in our student success funnel, connection is what we're talking about under these. So the first one, I had at least one professor at my college who made me excited about learning. That is the first of the six elements um, that are going to help set your students up for success. And I will tell you, this one is the most um, of, of all of the six of them this is the one that students most often experience if they experienced any of them. Um, so Matt, you and I, it was funny as we were talking about this, we had some different um, experiences, which, you know, I was a wreck in college. However, I did have a professor, I had a couple of professors in college that made me really excited about learning. Um, Dr. Trevathan, who is my favorite teacher. I took night classes from him every class he taught. So I would go and just listen to him lecture for three hours. He was genius and also super exciting. And then I also had a professor, Dr. Osborne, who's my honors Bible class teacher. And he was like a big deal in the field. And so I was always, I mean, I was a preacher's kid, but I would go and he would say things I'd never heard before. And I was like, that's amazing. So those are the two that come to mind for me. It looks like all of our attendees have had that experience. So that's awesome. You have a long list of faculty who made you excited about learning. I do. I mean, my very first intro to business class was Don Drennan and um, he was just awesome, you know, experienced. Uh, he worked for a dollar. He had to, the, the university had to pay him, I guess, so that he <laughs> He said, you know, but, but he worked for a dollar. He did it because he loved it. And you could tell he wanted us to understand the exciting parts of getting into um, the field. And so. Which so how he, genius to put him with freshmen. Oh, I think he, I think he asked for that. Like, yeah, you that's know, awesome. he's, he wanted to be the lead off hitter in, yeah. in the college. And so he was yeah, remarkable. Yeah. Um, I have a long list. Uh, so, you know, the, yeah. Well, this one, especially at our institutions, um, highly likely your students would say, yes, I had this experience. Um, but uh, I, I do think it's it's a great, you know, we, we've talked about that with your current students, especially if you're, if you're talking to your freshmen. Um, are there leadoff hitters for your freshmen? Because yeah. when you get in, into your major, you might find those who made you exciting. But if you don't have someone your freshman year, you're not connecting. You're not, you're not seeing the the potential in that field or in that in that um, yeah. area of study so for sure okay so the first one is a professor who made you excited about learning the second one my professors at blank or at college blank college cared about me as a person so another poll for that my professors cared about me as a person so i have reflected on this a lot because i i feel like First of all, a great question is how would you know? How would you know that your faculty care about you as a person? Um, but also Matt, you and I talked about, I don't have faculty I feel like cared about me as a person. I was pretty shy. I don't know how they would have known about and me as a person. <laughs> ex except for Dr. Trevathan. I mean, he- Yes, he was me. precious to me, but also, um, we have been talking about can we expand this now because remember we're this is very much about um faculty this is very much on the academic side of the house yeah. so if we can expand this a little bit broader and say there was somebody on my campus who cared about me as a person who invested in me and wanted me to be successful i think that changes the equation for some people so i'm not 
Yeah. I'm not giving us a buy on that. I'm not saying that faculty you don't have to do it, but I would be curious if we could expand that out into some student life and other uh, elements there. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, so I had a lot of professors who cared for me. I mean, I felt it got to a place where I just, I, you know, I, I assume that was part of the, the unique promise of my alma mater. Yeah. Okay, so my professor cared about me as a person. Um, I will tell you one time I was about to go to Italy and my professor, Dr. McElveen, who I didn't know knew my name, I was asking us what we were going to do. I think it was for spring break. And I told him I was going to do that. And afterwards he said, Rachel, come here. Do you have a camera? And I was like, I mean, I have like a junkie camera. And he was like, no. And he took me to his office and he gave me his, cam his nice camera. And he said, you cannot go to Italy without having a camera to take pictures. Wow. Take this and I just bring me your favorite picture. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> That's remarkable. That's a great example so, of feeling like he saw me as a person and cared for me. So, let, let me you. tell you a story about uh, Don Drennan. He, on the first day of class, gave us all note cards. And in this classroom, there's probably seven um, students, it's not seven, 70 students, he gave us all a note card. And he asked us to put our name, but then fill out some information about ourselves. Where are we from? What are we interested in? Um, you know, things like that. The second class he starts off and he says i you know a lot of y'all are new here and i just want to introduce everyone in the room and without any notes i mean just staring at us and pointing uh matt boisbear you might want to get to know eldon foskey he's also from the pacific northwest and loves to ski i don't know if y'all know each other but you are and i he went through every single person in that class on the second day of class without any notes and, and made that's when, connections for you <laughs> yeah and Eldon Foskey and I were friends you know, all through, <laughs> but, but it was like, that's where I thought this is unique. And, yeah. and awesome. when I went into the classroom and started to teach, I knew how powerful that was that I would learn my students' names uh, and, and try on the second day of class to at least know their name when they came in. But yeah, that's great. I love that. I love the, like, here's a connection that yeah. you can just go talk about, right? I don't know how he did it. Okay. So the last of our connection, excited about learning. I felt like they cared about me. The last one, which by the way, everybody had that experience at their institution and in our poll. So that's awesome. The last one is I had a mentor who encouraged me to pursue my goals. So this is interesting because now we've, we have taken it out of professor. We are talking about just a person who yeah. you felt like mentored you. But also there's this encouragement in it. You know, we talk about who's going to celebrate with you, who's going to push you, who's going to tell you you should do these things. It's so important to have somebody who is helping lead you through. And that's the, I see you, right? I see you. What are we trying to accomplish? Here's what we're going to do. And you, I did not have that experience. You have a great experience of that. Um, oh, so Dr. Rick Lytle, um, he just, he he started calling me Dr. Boisbert. Um, my sophomore year, he took me on like, hey, I not just academically, but all of these other things. He he was curious about about my um, well-being in, in a lot of different areas, about my relationships, uh, distance from home, because I was, you know, from Seattle in Texas. He wanted to hear how my family was doing, um, my my siblings, like every part of all five of those areas, he was challenging me and asking me. And he was one who said, Matt, you've got to go get your master's. I want you back here. Um, and so that he set a vision for me and, and pursued me. And even to this day, you know, that, that relationship is still there. So. Yeah, for sure. So it looks like for our polls, almost everybody, 86% had that experience, which that's awesome. I think it speaks to smaller schools often. Um, or even smaller departments, right, that you have access. We are talking a lot about um, seeing students as part of the job. I mean, your, your job is to see students, not to research, not to what, I, your job is to be present with your students. And it is a luxury that smaller schools often have yeah. um, to be sure. able to invest time in spending time with students. I think it changes the job. When you think about how, if, if I provide this piece, if I find a student and I encourage my, my colleagues 
let's find students and mentor them. Yeah. What, what that can bring out, uh, not only for that student's um, college experience, but then the impact that that has on their, on their you know, lifelong well-being is pretty powerful. I was just talking to the new provost at uh, Mary Harden Baylor, and she was saying that when she talks to faculty and she's like, just pick one. Yeah. And they're like, is that all? I love that. Like, that's what I want to do. She's like, yeah, there's a lot of data and there's this and we could do this and we could do these programs, but just pick one, just pick one that needs it and go and spend time with them and be an encouragement and be close to them. And it will make a difference. One thing so. that was interesting when we worked together at, at a university in the career center, Rachel, one thing that I, I knew would be powerful is, is connecting students, not only to faculty and staff, but connecting them to upperclassmen to be serve as mentors, but also with alumni. And, and we actually had the, the software that allowed students to go find an alum who was doing something that they were interested in. And, and it's pretty neat to see how people then got the career connections because most of the time people say most of the, the role that the mentor had was very, very influential on their uh, career um, yeah. outcome, where they got connected, how they found a job, more so than the career services office on their campus. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, one last thing about this connect or support side, if an employed graduate had a professor who cared about them as a person, who made learning exciting, and had a mentor who encouraged them to pursue their dreams, the graduate's odds of being engaged at work more than doubled. Only 14% of graduates reported having had all three. So when we're talking about the six things to do, we've had this experience, we have to figure out how to do measurements on our campus for our students to be able to say, yes, here is where I'm getting those first three things, okay? So strongly agree with the um, excited about learning, 63%, 27%. Uh, have professors that cared about them as a person, and then 22% had a mentor. So that's statistics from that report where they actually went in and asked all of those graduates. I think okay. what's, oh, keep going, sorry. Well, I just was going to say, um, were you gonna talk about all three statements? Yeah, 14% on that one. Yeah. Okay, so now we need to move over to experiential. Um, the first one is, this is interesting to me. The first of these three, I worked on a project that took a semester or more to complete. So we've moved now from the connection piece into this sort of um, intense learning. And the question is, did you have a project that took a semester or more to complete? Matt, did you? <laughs> yeah, I had, I had so many semester long projects, like a, a class, so many. So I, I started to make a list. I think there were at least five um, that, you know, from my, my uh, uh, principles of marketing class. I mean, it was brutal. If you, if you didn't work on it all semester, you wouldn't be able to get it finished. And, and that was made clear at the beginning. Yeah. So I had a lot of uh, semester long projects. So it looks like it's 60% of our participants had a long project, 40% uh, did not. I did not in my undergraduate, but in my master's degree, I had the same thing. I mean, it was like every semester we had another paper, gigantic paper or lit review or whatever. So it's interesting to me that that's a um, key piece of what we're talking about. And so again, how do you assess that? How do you connect with departments and say, we've got to embed in our courses one of these projects for students because it's so important to their future success. Well, this goes back to what Tinto was saying about, you know, being challenging, the challenging your students yeah. is very important. And, and a lot of times, especially when you think about um, some trends, you know, academic trends or, or just how um, that, especially during COVID, we saw a drop in some of those really challenging projects. Yeah. Maybe for good reason, a, but we have to get back to it. I just read a quote the other day that was like, the way to be a successful faculty member is to give a lot of work and comment on it consciously, which I really like, right? Because it's both connection and experience. Like, you, yes, you have to learn something, but then I'm going to give you feedback on what you're doing. Yeah. Okay, so a project that took a semester or more to complete is one of those elements that's crucial to future um, engagement and success. 
The next one is I had an internship or job that allowed me to apply what I was learning in the classroom. So this, I think there's a lot of different components of this. One that I want to kind of call out is the idea that it gives you a vision for why you're doing what you're doing. So I'm learning all of this stuff and that's great. But again, I didn't have this in my undergraduate, but in my master's degree, um, I was seeing clients every night at my internship. And so what that does when you're sitting in class and they're talking about, here's how you do counseling and here's the different theories and what you want to be looking for and blah, blah, blah. And I know tonight I have four couples who are coming in and expecting me to help them. And so I better be paying really close attention because I have immediate application. And if I don't pay attention, I'm not going to do a good job. I just think it helps you practice what you're learning, but also say like, this is why you're getting up and going to these classes because you need them. Right. So, so. Rachel, what's the name of the program? Shriner, it came out of Iowa. Is it, is it um, you work? work? And, and it is. It's such a powerful for student workers to apply what they're learning in the classroom um, to their job. And, and what happens is that their, their manager, student workers manager, actually asks them questions related to uh, how, what they're, what they're doing on their job connects them with their major. Yeah. So of our poll um, participants, all of them had internships. I would just say, again, we need to be measuring this. We need to be connecting with departments and the career center. However, you're doing that to make sure that students have a vision for why they're doing what they're doing, have an application of the work that they're doing, and also getting connected to people in your field. I mean, there's nothing like going and saying, I want to do an internship. And Ferris has been really successful with this. We have a lot of interns that come and do something in their field here. And we're like, we love you. Can we hire you? Right. So it's a really nice way to have focused application of what you're learning and to start those connections really early. So Absolutely. I love that. Okay. And the last one is I was extremely active in extracurricular activities and organizations while attending college. Were you, so, Rachel? I wasn't, but listen, <laughs> the more I've thought about this, the matter I get about it because, <laughs> um, in high school, I was, I told you the other day, I was in theater, I was in choir, I was in yearbook, I kept the book for all the sports, yeah. any sport there was, I did the book for it. I was super involved. And then I came to college, and I will tell you, I think where college failed me, and one of the action items I have for you guys today is, there was no on ramp, -ramp for me for any of those things. I didn't know how to, like, I don't know who the choir person is. I don't know how to get connected to theater. I don't know. I have no idea how to on-ramp any of those things. And so what I love about you saying that your professor is like, hey, so-and-so, that you just have to make those connections easy. Here are people that you could be connected to because you like doing these things together. Or yeah. here are organizations that you can be in, um, involved in because I'm looking at what you did in high school and these are places where you would fit and here's how you're going to get connected to them, right? So, sorry, I went on a whole rant there. No, I, I think that's right. I, I, this, this is critical for student. What is the student engagement plan? How do you yeah. onboard them? Um, if, if an admissions counselor knew you were so involved in high school and then met and ran into you right at freshman follies and was, would be like, why are you not doing freshman follies? Right. That would be one of those, you know, we always say with our schools, can you just write down what those in the, in the fall semester for a freshman, what are those experiences that if a student's not participating, they're not engaged. Yeah. They're just not, they've not yet made that transition into this community. And I like tying that to a eternal well-being, not eternal, like long time well-being goal and saying to students, hey, if you will get involved in two things, the likelihood that you are going to have well-being in your life is increased. So yeah. I think that that's great. Um, okay, so there's our six elements. I had a professor who was exciting uh, about learning. They cared about me. I had a mentor who helped me pursue, pursue my goals. I worked on a project long or semester long project. I had an internship, internship. Um, and then also I was active in extracurricular activities. So here's what that means. Um, 
those elements, and I'm reading from the report, more than any others have a profound relationship to a person's life and career, yet they are being achieved by too few. It should be a national imperative owned by higher education institutions, students, parents, businesses, nonprofits, and governments alike to change this. If that is not enough, those six things are tied to well being, right? If that's not enough, it's also tied to time to complete degree. So 75% of students who strongly agreed that they experienced all six of those things graduated in four years, as opposed to those who could not strongly agree with um, any of them, only 61% of those students graduated in four years. So there's a lot to be said about that. We don't have time to, draw, to jump into all of that. But I would just say, if you think about the case that we've just laid out, well-being, engaged workers, these six elements, the idea that college prepared me well for um, at life outside of college by giving me these six things, only 82% um, of respondents say all, all six, right? So no, the, yeah, the, the relationship, if, if they were, um, they had all of those big six, 82% of, of those who said they had all of the big six said that they strongly agree that they were, they were prepared, prepared for life after college. Yeah, so really powerful. Your action items for this are, first of all, you need to do research at your institution. You need to know whether or not these things exist and how we are delivering them to every single student. So going in and figuring out what those, where are those places where students are getting connected with faculty, they're being challenged to learn, they're getting mentors, where are those? And if we don't have them, we've got to get them because we're talking about future well-being. Next, we need to talk about projects and internships and how we're getting our students in extracurricular activities. And then make the case. I think it's really compelling to go through all of this data and say, if we can get these six things for every student, we've just increased their, what we've told them college is gonna do for them, promise. right? Delivery and on the promise. That's right. And then finally embedding those experiences by, by making them easy for students to on-ramp on -ramp into different um, extracurricular activities, making sure they're getting connected that cannot be something that they have to overcome in order to have those six things. We've got to figure out how to just make that really seamless and really easy for students to be able to connect. But like you said, it really does start with everyone on your campus understanding those relationships that Rachel's laid out today. So. For sure. So I want to end with a quote from the Scallop poll and we'll send you, um, Shauna has chatted the whole thing. There's a lot more good data in there. I would encourage you to go look at it, but here's the end quote. The initial findings from the 2014 Gallup Purdue Index shed light on how the effects of certain powerful college experiences can be felt for years and even decades after graduation. College students, their families, and American public all expect college is a transformational experience that leads to great jobs and great lives. All too often, however, that is not the case. Higher education has the power to change that. A national dialogue on improving the college experience should, should focus on ways to provide students with more emotional support and with more opportunities for deep learning experiences and real life applications of classroom learning. By taking action, colleges, educators, students, and their families can move the needle so more college graduates experience that great job and great life. I couldn't have said it better myself. No, nope, that's why we do what we do. So we right. need to do it. All right, friends. Thank you for spending time with us. If there's anything we can do to be helpful to you, let us know. Otherwise, have a great day. Have a great day.